welcome to our D and D uh, miniature painting stream. Um, today we are going to continue, maybe finishing these towers we've been working on. Um, we just have the top parts to finish, and then glue the whole thing together. They slot in just like that. So. We'll be working on that today and see how far we get. We'll have to wait a little bit for the um, wash to dry, but um, we'll have some stuff to do in the meantime, I think. Um, we use all of these uh, pieces that we make here on the show, or almost all at least, um, on our D&D stream, which is live on uh, Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern here on this Twitch channel. If you're interested in any of the designs that you see us printing and painting, um, you can go to our website, DysonDungeons.com, and under the Attributions tab, um, you can find a lot of the, almost all of the models that we use. So. The designs for the models that are printed, right? Yeah, we printed them ourselves, but the designs, the STL designs. So, that is where we're at. Um, I'm going to see if I can get this wash. It had a lot of sediment build up um, previously. Uh, I'm just seeing if I can sort of get that worked out. It goes on a little smoothly. Do you want to grab two gloves? So we're going to start off with the wash because that... Two. Um, well, you want one, right? I want one. You want just one today? Yeah, I'll be fine with just one. Because I'm not really going to be holding the other. And it'll be holding a brush. Um, so what we're going to do is start by washing these two to get them looking dingy and dirty like these pieces. Um, if you see a comparison, one is much brighter and fancier looking. And this one looks a lot more worn in and well used out in the wild. So we want to match this effect on the upper tier. And I don't honestly think that the wash is going to do anything to these ladders. They're just simple brown ladders. So we probably won't bother washing them. Um, but these ladders have little pegs and they uh, sit in like that. So when we have them up and usable, we have little ladders to go with them, which is pretty nice. So, I've been sort of stirring this around for a little bit. We'll see yeah. if that helped at all. With the... If it's still not, we can uh, spin it. It seems all right. It wasn't so much that it was thickened as it had developed like a... Like the um, pigments that sort of congealed a little inside the wet um the body of the paint mm -hmm. and it Sorry, created like a grit sort of effect so i think i'll start with the bottom um and when you're doing a weathering sort of effect like this even an area like this where you're not really going to ever see it, presumably, unless you're like looking underneath the model. But when it's in use, it will barely be visible, if at all. You still want to get the tone sort of matching the same, because even if you just see a flash of that brighter color, um, it can, you know, stand out a bit. And then you go, oh, it wasn't really washed under there so it's a good idea even if it's something like the bottom where you're barely ever gonna see it you don't want it sticking out like a sore thumb and i'm sort of going with the grain of the print right now because i just want to tone and you have to be careful when you're washing against the grain of a print um especially like in wood and stuff where it has an actual grain built in um, these are PLA prints, so they're deposited as threads, and they do develop a little bit of a, uh, 
a grain to them. Um, and what you want to do is, if you're going against the grain, you want to be a little careful and slower because you can form bubbles from the rapid up and down movement of the brush going across. Um, and bubbles tend to, when you're uh, doing a wash especially, when they dry, they leave a little circle um, on your model, which might not really be what you want. Have random bubble circles all over your model. But we're definitely going to need a lot more wash than that. Oh, yeah. Considerably more wash. So, what I like to do with a wash, um, is before I get too crazy, like far with it, too all over the place, I like to get a nice coat. If I'm doing a whole piece like this, where the whole thing is washed at least, I like to, in the area I am washing, just get it coated because the wash will um, move along on itself a lot easier than on a dry piece. So. Once I get everything sort of wet with the wash, I can then move it around with the brush a lot more effectively and get it looking how I want. And one thing to consider with a wash is that it um, it's so thin. Basically, it's a very, very thinned paint is how to think of it. And because it's so thin, it will move with gravity a bit. Um, so when you're drying it, one thing to consider is how your figure is placed, because if you want it to dry like this, it will seep in against the back. If you want, if you set it like this, it'll tend to wash downwards a little bit and fill in cracks a little more vertically. So there's just some little things to working with a wash like this. And this is something you can't really do until you have the whole piece base coated and cleaned and ready to go. So if you look, here's it's still shiny because it's wet, but unfinished, finished. It's a lot darker, a lot dirtier. Um, you know, it gives you a much more uh, used look that you might want in something like a bandit tower that's out in the woods. So. Just have to repeat the process on four sides. Which is easy enough. And something you're going for with a wash is you want a sense of sort of inconsistency, but also like a internal logic to why it looks like that. So, for example, um, think about where where gets used the most. If you're um, painting, if you're giving someone's armor a wash, the joints are going to be more worn and used, or oiled, or you know any sort of um, wear and tear will happen more where they were. Uh, being moved a lot. Um, likewise, if your armor is battle-worn, think about where would enemies be targeting? Where would there be slashes and scuffs and things like that? Um, so you can sort of build out the character of a piece in the, um, in the weathering and washing process, which I always think is a lot of fun. Um, That's just something you get to think about as you're applying all of this wash. Maybe spots are darker than others. Maybe something's been 
upgraded or replaced and it looks a little cleaner in an area things like that so they have three sides wash one to go and then we have to do the top And one thing to consider if you're doing a piece that's getting joined together like this is you want them to look roughly the same in their weathering if you're at a lower part, unless it has some story reason, I suppose. So if your lower part looks way more weathered and old than your upper part, maybe the upper part was built later on top of an older structure. But... If you're going for a tower in this case where the whole thing was built at the same time you want to try and match your weathering to be fairly consistent between the pieces if you're going to be joining them together after the clean after the weathering and the reason we're doing that here is it's just going to be so much easier to handle uh, these individual sections and then glue them together than it is to uh, try and handle one large piece and weather it and get inside and everything. So when I'm tackling the top here, I like to, of course, get my whole area wet with... Um, the wash, of course, but I want to consider where is movement happening? Where is dirt collecting? Um, dirt will normally collect in the corners and along the edges, of course, but also, um, you know, this is a guard tower. There's presumably lookouts uh, going along the sides of it, so the sides will tend to be dirtier than the middle. Um, so I might try to aim for that. Um, and so now that I have it all wet, I can go in and deposit a thicker amount of wash on the side edges. <clears throat> I, uh, Flots... Flots 22? Well, thank you for joining us while we're uh, Thank you. Oh, 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 hi. Hi, Canterbury Rovers. Yes, we are. Um, we're just working on some weathering right now on these guard towers. Um, and I want to get the edges looking a little dirtier than the middles. Just because that's where the dirt would tend to uh, collect a bit more. So, now that it's all in there, it's just a matter of taking some time and uh, spreading it fairly evenly. And I'm going along on the inside of the wall too, just to make sure the tone matches the rest of the piece. Um, although it won't show terribly much, I just want to make sure it has the same amount of uh, weathering that everything else does. Just like this. Alright. So, I'm going to get back into my central floor here. Oh, yeah. I'm just about finished with this. And we'll let these uh, set aside and dry, which takes a while. Yeah, it can take about 
the wash because it's so wet will take longer to dry than um, an acrylic paint. Probably about 30 minutes before these can be handled fairly, um, fairly well without causing too much of a problem. And since we're getting low on our wash here, I am uh, going to just use up what's there and then we're not wasting any. And are always breaking off little pieces. Of <clears throat> Hmm. One of the legs. Oh, one figure. of our uh, joist legs. So we have these extensions put on there because it will sit inside another the lower else. section. Kind of like so. Once I get it lined up. I tried some epoxy, but it isn't really holding it. To make a larger tower. So... That will get all glued together later, but um, creating a nice large sort of guard tower for D and D. This actually seems to be breaking in a different place each time. Does it? Yeah. So I'm gonna leave this to dry, and I'm gonna leave it to dry vertically because the uh, wash will somewhat run downwards, and I want it to look like it was rained on and things like that. So. Any slight downward movement of the wash is an okay thing um, for what I'm looking for here. If you wanted a more consistent look, you would have to do one side, let it dry on that with that side facing upwards, and uh, then go around, paint the next side, wait for it to dry facing upwards, and so forth. So that can take a while, but... Um, it can give you a nice result. So I'm going to try a little bit of wood glue since this is balsa wood. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that holds. It takes a little bit longer to dry, but it should be soon enough to put it together later. I mean, it's not really weight bearing, it's just going to fit into a slot. Yeah, it just has to hold in place, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm going to quickly clean out this cup so that the wash that's left in here doesn't dry and make a mess. I'm just sticking this thing on here. Yeah, holding it for a second so that it stays more or less vertical. And get it out of the way and hopefully in about half hour or more or less it will be set well enough so that uh, we can move on with and since i'm here i'm going to be changing over our prints that are on our printers back here with them No, it's um, not falling over, so that's a good well, it did because I touched it. So what are we going to do while we watch paint dry? Well, you have a horse you can work on, if you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you'd like to do the horse, you can. I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to work on yet. No horse. This currently just has sort of a base coat for fur on it, mm -hmm. but you can see there's a relatively large level of detail going on in this horse. This saddle under... You'll see more as it gets painted in, but... 
it's going to be gaudy. It's going to be. Do you want a little? I think purple and green and uh, orange. Would you like a painter's handle? Oh, we could try one. Okay, I'm we gonna just, go grab those. We just those. bought those, so we could give those a go. So what I'm going to do next is there's all these little uh, little leather straps all over, you know, holding the bit and the bridle and the saddle and everything on. So part of the way this is designed is it's hard to see them. So I'm going to try to paint them um, so that I can see them. And I think I will paint them. What shall I paint them? Alright. Okay, I'll help get you set up here. And explain what we're using. Should I, should I make this, I mean, really intensely gross? What, like color-wise? Yeah. That's up to you? Mm. So. Turquoise. Turquoise letters. What this is, is a painting handle. It's good for miniatures. Um and all that so the way it works is fairly simple this part comes off if you need to remove the miniature from the handle but you take some sticky tack which looks like gum but it isn't i'm gonna use just an exacto knife and take about half of this Looks like it'll be about good. Yeah. Yeah. More than enough. I'm gonna wrap this back up. Put it aside. So you fill the inside of this circle with like a sticky tack, basically. Then, uh. Then. I could use like a third of it, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you take whatever your figure is. Horse, of course. In this case, a horse. And you can imprint it into the sticky tag like this. Um, you can make sure it's nice and secure so you can do all sorts of movement with it and it doesn't uh, fall. And then well, it's on the handle. Now you can paint your horse like so, rotating it as needed, and you're not handling it directly. Um, this does a couple things well. One, if there's wet paint on it, you're not getting wet paint on your fingers, which can then be transferred elsewhere. Um, two, it does it protects the model from having the oils in your fingers rub onto it um and that can wipe away paint and also like on a more delicate figure cause problems in terms of the uh, surface and lastly it gives your hand a little bit of a break it's a lot easier to hold something thicker and larger like this than it is to be pinching a smaller figure all the time so it's a little easier on your hand um for long-term painting so here you go one horse on a stick horse on a stick and a whole bunch of straps that need to be discovered and painted so since we haven't used these ones particularly at all um they are we'll probably have a little bit of a learning curve getting used to holding this uh handle specifically um but you know being able to rotate it and everything i think we'll find is very nice but there will be a little bit of a a process getting there getting used to it so what that means is i need to figure out what I'm doing. What I might do is work a little on these crystal clusters that I have had sitting around for some time now. 
I have three sizes of crystal cluster. Um, what I think I will do is they're on like a stone surface. So I'm going to, I believe, start getting the stone in. So I have sort of my base filled in for each of these. Um, I'll probably go with neutral gray, dark gray. What do you think for the base? Um, I think maybe neutral gray, kind of the same color it is now. All right, so I'm going to take this neutral gray. Hmm. I was just going to say about something about that gray never takes sides. Oh. But I'm not going to say that. So, my big thing will be uh, getting the detail in on this gray first. Um, obviously, I don't want to paint all my blue crystals a dark gray, but... So, what I'm going to do is go along the edges and define the line between the crystals and the rock that it is embedded in. And once I get a good amount of that border established, I can take a larger brush and just go along the bottom here um, to fill in the rest of the figure. But first things first, I want a nice edge. And there's rock inside these crystal structures that'll be a little tricky to get into. Um, I'll just have to think about how I am approaching the, uh, the, the model with my brush and there'll probably be spots I need to clean up but since it's all blue right now I haven't put any of the texturing in all of that all that means is I take a little bit of that blue and go over wherever it might need a cleanup quite simple so while I want to be careful I don't have to be so careful because I'm not painting this into a uh, piece that I put a lot more time and energy in. Right now it's just blue crystals. So I have a question about horse tack. Yeah. This comes down like this and there's a scap there. Uh -huh. Is that the bit? Is, should that be painted too? Um. So there's a little strap mm -hmm. there that will be painted. There isn't really a visible bit yeah. in this model, but there is an under strap. Yeah, I got that. That will need to be the same color. Because of the size and scale of the model, the bit itself isn't particularly visible. So there will be a little cleanup required, but as you can see, there's stone in all of these uh, crystal structures that I need to sort of get down into. And then I'll be taking a little blue and just cleaning up the, uh, the crystals afterwards. I'm not going to beat myself up if I get a spot here or there. Just because this is a fairly 
difficult area to get into. But as you can see, it's sort of filling in that inner stone with some gray. And I'm just going to continue going around the outside edge as well as I go and making sure I get the line between the blue crystal and the stone. up in these crystal patches it can be a little difficult but not too bad turquoise uh barding huh mm -hmm. that's very fun i decided to not go with purple and green i'm going to use various shades of blue on everything oh wow it's going to be schematic I decided to, uh, usually this stuff is the invisible part, and then you don't see it much, but it's really awfully now. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a parade horse, basically. Yeah. Or very ostentatious. No wall, maybe. Some sort of bard. Maybe it's the voices for it. <laughs> Could be. Uh, for some reason, I feel like he would travel by, like, Aliquin. Mm. You know? You know, if you could get people to carry your phone. I assume he could. Mm -hmm. the voice and all. You see, this horse has a lock of its mane right over that. Yeah. It's kind of a voicey thing. Mm hmm.
us getting through all of this complicated stone. And once it dries, I'm going to go in and clean up all of the spots inside. They'll be a lot easier to reach after this uh, bottom is all painted in. And I don't have to worry so much about... Because uh, I'm instead of reaching in all the way, I'm only having to reach down to the points where they are uh, in need. So I'm going to... I think I have all of the inside stone painted in. Um, there it is. All that inside section of stone. So I just have a little more on the outside here, along here, to define the edges of. And then I can take a larger brush and um, go around the bottom of the base and get everything that should be stone painted gray. the bottom of the crystals painted. Just gonna clean my brush off here before I start handling another one. Um, and to do this, I'm gonna use, this is sort of an old, uh, older brush that I should probably throw away, but haven't yet. Um, but since I do not need to be exact, and it can hold a fair amount of paint in it. Um, I'm just going to use it to slowly go around the outside edge here. And get all of this surface area covered. Now we have the stone uh, placed in for this. It's still pretty wet, so I'm going to just set it here for a minute. Clean off my larger brush. And since I have my gray open here still, I'm going to resume. Uh, keep painting in stone, but now on the medium size. Which will be probably a little trickier. We'll see. And once that's dry, um, I can go in and clean up the little bits of crystal where there might have been a flake of gray here or there. But I want to let that be for now. So the same exact process, just smaller. And I'm actually going to just go around the bottom edge of the crystal first, and then after I've done that, I'm going to tackle the inside gray. How's your horse? Mm, not too bad. I think I got it at all of them. Sometimes when there's this black on black, it's kind of hard to tell what's where. Yeah, so that has a black primer on the horse, and it, since it's all a single color of primer across the whole horse, it can, with that much detail, make it a little hard to differentiate what's what. Um, it kind of hides all the different lines. So, part of painting those horses is, uh, once you get your base coat in, just doing a lot of corrections to make sure it all looks correct. All looks right. Mm 
Okay, so I've outlined the bottom of my stone, not that you can see it all that well. Um, so now I have, there's sort of two sides to these crystal models that have stone, and then there's sort of this central line here that has no, um, no stone visible in between it. So I'm going to just tackle one side at a time as best as I can. I'm going to rinse this and get another color. So this uh, gray is going to be a little messier in here because it's smaller. It's not a real big deal because I will be doing a cleanup process with it. Anyway. Uh, and it's mostly just about making sure I get the gray in where it needs to be right now. At this stage. And I'm making these crystals blue, specifically because blue crystals um, play in a fair amount to our current D&D uh, &D campaign that's on this channel, Sundays, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, be there, Sunday. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of technology that has these crystal, these blue crystals as a... Uh, power source. So these might be sort of the raw crystal um, as it occurs in nature. That's a slight problem. Do you have a pair of tweezers? Uh, I have so many of them. The head of this ancient shitty brush fell off in the paint. Oh, no. So, I think it's time to say goodbye to this ancient warped brush that I've been using way too long. Yeah, would you agree? <laughs> well... I'm just trying to conserve what paint I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's about all I can do. So, that's what happens when a brush gets very old and very well used. So, I'm just going to set that to the side and toss it later. No paint on the tweezers. All right. So, I'm going to use its sibling, which is probably just as old and uh, decrepit but the head seems a fix still. So that's a big plus, apparently. I still have bristles, huh? 
the uh, yeah, the the bristles aren't actively falling off the brush. So, there is another crystal cluster with some stones put into it. Clean off this brush here. And that leaves us with this tiny cluster. Now for the tiny cluster, it's so small, I am not going to bother with stone on the inside. Um, that could easily be, you know... A crystal structure in and of itself. So all I'm gonna do with this tiny one is get stone along the outside part here. And I shouldn't need a bigger brush to do this than this little one here. And I'm just focusing in a little here, so I might be quiet for a minute. Okay, nice and easy little stone base on the smallest structure. So. I should be, unless I need some corrections, done with the neutral gray, um, which is great. I'm going to set that aside. Um, our washed towers are almost dry. Mm -hmm. So before I jump into correcting these crystals, just to give them a little extra time to dry, I'm going to set them over to the side here, um, so they're out of the way, and I think once you're at a good breaking point on the horse, don't break the horse, but once you're at a good stopping point on the horse, I think we can try to glue these together. Yeah, give that a shot. Painting this mm -hmm. and discovering more places where the aquarine writing chapping should have gone. Yep. The more you paint the horse, the more you realize there are spots that should have been painted a different color. I found that when I painted that. That one specifically, too. Mm hmm. Let me just finish this side of it. Yeah, I almost found it was easier 
to just put a big base coat over it just so I could see everything and then put in all the detail work afterwards even mm -hmm. if it was a little waste of painty um yeah it's not that much paint and there's just a lot that you can miss easily Oh, and then there's a lump of plastic there that needs to be cut off. Yes, um, with pretty much any uh, 3D print, um, there is a, uh, the way 3D prints work, both um, PLA deposit style, PLA or ABS deposit style prints like these, or um, like this puma or the horse that dad here is working on which are resin prints um and that's sort of mostly down to materials resin prints print uh upside down whereas pla are deposited from the base up um but regardless for both of them they require some structural support to happen so if you have say on this crystal an overhang like this um like that crystal overhang there it's printing with the base on the bed um but this might be too far out to properly support the material as it gets deposited so you put in support structures so it'll create a pillar vertically to go up alongside it to help support that material while it's still being deposited. Um, after the fact, you cut off all of those um, supports to create your sort of final object. But sometimes you can still find, you, you don't get them all necessarily. Uh, so you, before you start painting a print, you painted, you printed yourself or even if you just bought a print online, um, we purchased those horses online and they weren't all necessarily perfectly cleaned of their supports. So it's always good to take a nice thorough look over anything that's been 3D printed and just using like a X-Acto knife or some other similar thing, carefully removing any remaining supports that might be uh, hiding on it because you can run into them while you're painting and now you have um, like an awkward pillar or an awkward like little section of material that you don't um, necessarily want to paint because it looks out of place. So. So. If you want. If you want, these actually come with, they have a little metal plate that you can stick onto your counter or onto a block or something. And you can, that so it'll adhere there, you know? So you can have a, like a spot to set it where it won't easily get knocked over. Um, we haven't done that yet, but you know, as a tape on this side. It's just sort of a nice little feature. Yep. So we might, maybe we'll make a little block of wood up mm -hmm. there and stick them onto it. Yeah. And I can. Yeah. Yeah, they're really under there. So I'm thinking the way these go in is like so, right? Mm hmm. So I'm thinking what we'll want to do is have glue at the bottoms of the pillars to adhere to the floor. Hmm. Okay. And along the side edges. Yep. And then if you grab a close pin. Uh, you're thinking. Like that? No. Right. Oh, okay, to hold them yeah, together. So it'll squeeze against the center. Against it. Alright. 
So, question about these little ladder things. Yeah. You want them like on opposite sides, like the way you yes. got it there? So, just to show, we have this shorter ladder that goes here, and then we have a longer ladder that will fit here. Sort of. They're not long enough, actually. But, theoretically, you want your ladders, I think, to go like that, right? Yeah. So, so, I, would vote, so they would, I would put the pegs on the so same side. So you should have the pegs on the same side. Okay. When we adhere them. Okay, so I'm going to mix up some epoxy. Yeah, we've got, do uh, we have eight clothespins there? We have four, seven. Hmm. We have our one clothespin short of a okay, clothespin not close yet. in that. Do you want to deposit it on the outside of these or on the inside of these? I'm not sure. I think the inside. What do you think? I agree. Less likely to get glue on everything when we're moving the mm -hmm. top. Did you, uh, film? No, I just got a little bit on my fingers. It's ducking up on the tip. Ah, uh, gotcha. So. The main thing, the only thing we have to be particularly careful of is making sure the top is oriented the correct way when it's gluing in. Um, because we want, yeah. We want it to, the ladders, to go in the same direction. Although I have to see if we have a longer ladder model than this. Because this is uh, a little too short. I'm going to quickly grab your top so it's over here. Mm -hmm. oh, be careful of that one leg though. Okay, I will not turn it over until it's time to glue. Let's start with that one. So we'll be putting it on the insides of these verticals. Yep, that's where it mostly will need to be. And then once it is in there, I'll be attaching each side and giving it a little pressure with these clothespins. It's important to make a giant mess. Mm -hmm.
eyes feel like the way they should have been, and now the designer did not show it on this way. Is with these posts at the top. Yeah. I just felt like they should have been that way. Rather than cut off at the bottom. Yeah. But we're doing them as the designer made them, so. So there. All right. So I'm going to try and line this up to minimize mess as much as possible. And now that it's in there. I want to go around. And clip all the corners. And clip all the corners around. Get this ladder out of the way. And this should all hold really well. This should theoretically, yes, hold quite well. Once it's all glued in place. So, I'm going to set this off camera out of the way so I can't knock into it, which would be bad. And double check that, yes, I did put it in the right orientation. Because, you know, seems like a thing I would do. So. <laughs> put it in backwards or something. Right? Yeah. Yeah, at least you didn't get it in up, like upside down. That would be hard to do, actually. Mm-hmm. That's kind of nice seeing these towers be done. Yeah, they took like a lot longer than uh, we thought they would. There's a secret amount of uh, surface area in these towers. They look very spindly, but they actually have a lot in them. So, orientation is matching. One thing that'll be nice is we won't have to worry about the broken leg anymore. Yep. All right, now, on each one, I'll adhere a clip just to make sure they're nice and tight against the glue while it dries. Alright, that is two towers, just like in Lord of the Rings. Oh, they look just like them, too. <laughs> Alright. Do you need any cleanup? Right. No, I'm fine. I didn't have you to handle to, the glue. You glue this back together? Or just no, toss I'm it? just going to toss it. <laughs> I keep not tossing it. <laughs> I think that was a sign to just be done with it. Yeah, it was time. And I'm going to move these ladders over and out of the way as well. There. Okay, now so, we've got uh, like an hour left. What are we going to do? Well, you have a horse and I have crystals. Oh, a horse still. You're just like, <laughs> I don't want to do the horse. Thing. No, it's coming along okay. Well. Now that I'm finding out where things are. I can take a look and see if we have anything to glue. If you're not feeling... Oh. Mm -hmm. No, I'm fine painting the horse. Because I think we're making these sorts of uh, tiles that I think go like this. Hmm. Are they going to They have like colors? Okay. I think they go like... No, Lexi will have to confirm. I think they go like this for when it transfers into a single wide hallway. Oh, uh, okay. I believe that's how it goes. It we'll sense. see. But we've been printing these floors lately. No, I'll keep working on this horse thing here. And before I jump in, those are close to done printing, so I'm just going to stand up and stretch for a minute. Keep my back from getting too tense. Yeah, my back's really been hurting the last few days. 
And I'm going to need the flat blue for the crystal tojo. <sighs> Yeah, those horses are sort of never ending. I think I spent like five episodes painting them. But we're down to the last horse out of uh, six, six, eight? No, no. Um, six, I think. They're both at like 96% then. I don't want to get into it and stop and change them. So if you're going extra, extra showy on this, are you going to do... Sorry. Polished gold for the metal fitting. Well, actually, I was thinking of that, yes. Gold, gold-plated fittings? Yeah. I, don't know I could just go brass, but, you know, why? Or, um, so, God, heaven forbid, silver. No, that would be gross. <laughs> Although, it would play more in the blue color. But the gold will set off from the blue color. So, that might be more showy. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I've been at 96% for a while now. I wonder if the readout is. I'm sure it'll probably just jump up to 100 from 96. Yeah, that'll happen. gonna give them just a minute to cool. Um, I'm gonna let them continue cooling inside the printer after I pop them off, but it just keeps them, they're a little more pliable when they're hot because they're plastic, so I don't want a wonky floor. Yeah, or well, you don't want to break it when you take off the base. Looking at is a mostly, not completely, dry uh, base coated crystal here. I have, it's really simple, just 
stone, blue crystal. I'm going to be doing additional um, designs on the crystal later, but I want to make sure my base all right, looks uh looks good. Um, there's nothing worse than doing a whole bunch of fancy stuff, and then there's a little section that didn't get painted properly showing through. Um, so there's a couple spots between the stone and the crystal where some of the gray got on the crystal, just because I was squeezing in such tight spaces. So well, all I really want to do is take my blue paint and just gently and carefully cover up those spots and get the crystal looking the color it should. There's also spots where when I put the first coat of blue on it, um, after it dried, there was like a little bit here and there that, uh, as the paint sort of dried and contracted, didn't adhere perfectly, so I'm gonna touch those up as well. But the vast majority of the touch-up is gonna be along the bottom edge of each of these crystal clusters. Just making sure the definition between where the stone is and the crystal is where it should be. And I'm just gonna choose a crystal to start with and then go one after the other until I get back around to the original crystal. Now I, I make sure I'm not missing anything. Rather than jumping around all over. Okay, this is coming along nicely. I 
like a sneeze. <coughs> okay. Ooh. Okay. Nope, just dropping it. That's all part of the process. Okay, I just needed to clean up the middle crystal now. And then I think I'm happy with this as a base. This crystal has been cleaned up a bit and it's basically just a nice sort of boring gray stone with crystal extruding out of it. The uh, medium sized one here is going to require a bit more cleanup um, and a little more careful cleanup just because of how much smaller it is. It was a little harder to be as exacting. So, gotta take my time with it and just get little bits, little bits each brush. There's just a lot of small corrections that need to occur, especially on the inside of this crystal cluster. Um, it is mostly about getting the gray in the right spot originally, and now this stage is about really defining the line between crystal and stone. And a lot of this really comes down to um, lining your brush up in the right spot. As you approach, 
I'm having a hard time holding this for you some reason. put that on one of those. Uh, I holes. feel like I should, but it's like, I'm okay. I just don't want to hold it too tightly because I'm constantly rotating it. Mm. And I don't want to strain my hand. Um, but that does lead to some, some drops. And you know what? That's probably good enough. Is it perfect? No, but you can't see where it's not perfect. And I'm just going to give a quick look here on this tiny crystal. There should not be much uh, to do on it. But where there is, I just want to put a couple small. Directive. Brush strokes. Great. There we go. Alright. So, drop that in the water. And close up my blue here. Now, what I'm going to want to think about... Well, this dries a little, is um, how do I want to make these crystals look sort of mystical and arcane and all of that? Um, they're sort of described as like a, a blue-white. Um, and they sort of radiate an energy from them. So, there's a few approaches I could do. I could put veins through it, through the crystal itself. I could try to create sort of a gradient effect on the crystals. Um, it's just going to be some experimentation. I'm going to experiment with the top of this big crystal here um, for a couple of reasons. It's the largest faceted section of the whole figure, so it will let me experiment with the facets and everything and two it's as far away from the gray stone as i can possibly be so if i don't like how the experiment turns out i just put some blue paint over the top and uh call it a day let it dry and i can try something new so i think I'm just going to look around it, sorry, our paints. So I have a few things I might work with. I have this blue wash, which really needs to be shaken up because it has not been used in some time. Um, I have a blue wash I could maybe do something with to get that blue effect. Um, I can also take something kind of interesting, like we have this metallic chrome. Gravity is not on my side today. This sort of, it's a very thin metal, uh, but it's like got this chrome effect to it. So I could 
sort of feather in metallic color and then put a blue wash over it to create a sort of shimmering blue crystal effect um, with it. It's a very mm. fancy looking horse you're making. Mm -hmm. Another thing I could do is um, put, I don't know, I could be, I, I could take a lot of time and very carefully sort of feather in a thinned paint to create a, uh, a sort of effect that I might want. I think if you mix the metal with a little bit of blue wash, that might look really good. Do it beforehand, and then... <laughs> yeah. Well, in that case, I have two separate bottles to shake up. Because <laughs> neither of these have been used in some time. They're both on the uh, condensed side. So, if I want to experiment with this, this is the chrome. It's a very bright silver, obviously. I put about three drops in. And then here is my sort of a gray blue wash which is a very thin type of paint and I'll put like a single drop in and we'll sort of mix them together see what we get A mm, little more blue. Um, Quite more. a bit more blue, actually. I'm going to do one drop at a time here. Do you have one of those toothpicks around? Next one. That's not perfect. Be a little better for mixing. Like that. Yeah, give that a try. That's two parts blue wash, one part chrome. <laughs> and I'm just going to work on the very top here. I'm just going to play around with it, see what I can do. If I don't like it, all I have to do is wash, wait for it to dry, and then put some of the blue back on top, and I am kind of covered.
Well, that was the, the story of coming at it from the right angle. Uh -huh. I didn't. I wonder what color I made. <laughs> I painted buff. It looks like it might be buff. Yeah. yeah okay. I'll figure out what color it's going to be when I start the massive switch up. So this is sort of roughly playing with the facets themselves. I feel like that doesn't look quite right. It's a little too technical for a crystal structure. Um, one thing I want to try is just very thinly dry brushing some of this crystalline effect instead. Um, And I want to work sort of out from these edges. Especially the corners of the facet. So dry brushing is just sort of a simple process where you take um, a tiny bit of paint on your brush, get almost all of it off your brush, usually just dabbing a bit, and um, then you can apply a very thin, almost completely dry amount of paint onto your figure or model. And that helps create sort of a translucent effect. Um, Do you think that's not really cool? That's not bad. So I'm gonna go around the top with this and just see what it looks like all together um, before I make any real decisions about how I want it to be looking.
And by doing an experiment like this and knowing I can just get rid of it if I don't like it, it gives me a little bit more freedom to test things and see if it's coming the way I want it. It's kind of easier that way. So what I think I'm learning from doing this task is that I liking the sort of dry brush effect I'm able to get out of this, but I don't like the solid facets quite so much. Hmm. But what do you think? The solid edge facets, I feel like, are too much. Yeah, I'm thinking the... So... Oh, yeah, the... the junction lines yeah so and that's sort of what this test was about was getting to see what i like what i don't like but i feel like i could be fairly successful with the dry brushing effect that i'm getting out of this given that so what i'm gonna do this needs to dry a little before i can paint over it again and uh, revert it but I can take my middle-sized one and do a similar test while I still have this paint mixture here. Just to make sure I do, in fact, like it.
Yeah, that's better. Without, without it, I'm not. It will naturally collect a little on the edges. Mm hmm. Um, but it doesn't need to be so pronounced. So, here's sort of experiment too. And I think that's a much more successful crystalline look. I just want to make sure. It looks sort of consistent across the whole thing. Okay, so that is what I'll be doing um, probably next time. Um, for now, that top should be dry, so what I want to do is get the top covered up so I can start fresh next time. Um, because that'll take a little bit to dry just because of the amount that's there, and we only, we're getting close to five, so. This will probably be the last thing I really do today. Just go in, get this back to its base coat. And I did it all up on top here, like I said, because I really can just go quick, get it covered. Doesn't cause any fuss. Just get it all in like so. Give that a once over, and all of that testing I did is effectively erased. <laughs> Alright, so I'm gonna leave this medium crystal in so I can sort of see what I did previously. And when it's all covered and has this sort of sheen to it, I think it should look nice and crystalline. Um, and what I'll probably do before I do that is give the rock below a black wash. Um, in fact, I could probably do that before we wrap up here. Because it won't take very long. But I think, you know, you want it to look dark and craggly. So you take... A little bit of a black wash. Give it a little shake. Get a couple drops out to start. And just go around everywhere where it's gray, giving it this sort of dark, inconsistent look. So it looks more like a rock. And I'm doing this quick before we finish, just because it takes a while to dry, being a wash. And it gives you this nice, darkish base. I will do the same. with the medium. Just spreading it around. Getting it up in the inner gray sections. Trying to make sure I control the volume on the brush. Um, Especially when getting in these tighter areas. You don't want 
terribly much in here, but you want it to be toned down. And gives this nice rock effect. Without grabbing the wet top here, it'll be the same story on the large crystal. What do you think of the red down there? It's Too very flashy. Conscience. It's flashy, but that's what you're going for, right? Mm hmm. I think it would be fine. I would put a little red somewhere, maybe the saddle or something, to tie it together. Because if you just have one spot of red, are you using the glossy red? No. Oh, okay. It just looks very glossy. It is flat. Those, that red just comes out very bright. One more side to do, and then I will have the rock pretty much where I want it, so it's not so flat and gray and basic. There we go. It's a little shiny right now. That'll uh, tone down as it dries. So, now that I have my crystals coming along, I have a plan for finishing them with this medium crystals appearance uh, right here. To give it that silvery sheen. I think given that we're close to five here, I'm gonna wrap it up. That is a very ostentatious horse. <laughs> How is the handle? It's actually very helpful. Good. So, all that's left is a little cleanup, which you all don't need to see. Um, Oh, we should uh, look at our towers before we close. <coughs> Got some dark blue to do, and then a whole bunch of touch up. <coughs> Seems fairly sturdy. Obviously, I'm not going to smack it against anything, but. No smacking.
There is Tower 1. Hmm. You know what I'm thinking? What? I'm thinking of uh, cutting some small pieces of and gluing them in here. Gluing them here. I agree. Kind of fill in the gap and close it up. Yeah. It won't close completely. But it will visually fill it in. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do next time to finish these up is cut eight pieces of balsa wood that are about this tall to mm -hmm. the floor. Um, paint them brown. No, we'll glue them in and then paint them. Okay. Yeah. As long as we don't hit the floor. Yeah. Uh, we're going to glue them into these corners just to fill them in so they look... You don't get any sort of gapping here. Because uh, if you want to, we can paint them. It helps fill in down in these areas. So yeah. Even if it doesn't close completely. It'll visually yeah. fill it in. Mm -hmm. So that is to most pretty much complete towers that are glued in. I can do this and they're not falling apart, which is a nice thing. Yeah, not falling apart. So, um, thank you for everyone who stopped by. Yep, thank you. Um, get a little look at a fancy in-production horse. Still has plenty of additions going on, but it's extremely gaudy. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, we will be um, painting again on Friday, and you can always check out our D&D uh, &D stream Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern here on our Twitch channel. Um, thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Bye.